Welcome to episode number 4040. I'm your host, Alpha Mike. What are we going to be talking about today? It's the show called The Policy. How agencies create policies, what they're doing versus what they should be doing. And how statistically they're gathering information on policies on the next L Police Radio. The policy. So many agencies create their policies, and there are different methods for creating policy. Some have a committee, some have a bureau or a section that creates the policy, and some tap into some of the registered experts in the agency as well. What method your agency uses we might probably touch upon today. But what we're going to look at also is statistical gathering information on how agencies kind of benchmark, work with each other on creating policy, the legal aspect of it, how important that is, the training aspect of a policy, the accreditation aspect of a policy, and, of course, uh, you want to know the 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 heart of the agency, the officers that have to fulfill the policy, what their intake is on the creation of one. Now, <clears throat> I could tell you, I've got horror stories to tell you on policy making and some personal or professional feedback on it. So we got a, a lot to talk about, but you know, as we, as we put that to the shelf for a second, we have, of course, how can you connect with us through lpoliceradio.com and our social networking as well. We're moving content. This is uh, episode number 40. We are headed steadfast into September where we will celebrate our one uh, uh, one year anniversary of um, El Police Radio and uh, we have a lot of content and as I said or I've said before you know one show about an hour long produces another two to three hour of editing that produces another two or three hours of research so you have research and development you've got the actual show I try to run the show like if I'm live. That's my experience when I did it uh, back in 07 to 2014, seven years, 150 shows. It was live. There was no such thing as editing. So I try to keep that same foundation. So I might have a hiccup here and a hiccup there, but I keep going. And as a result, we then edit certain things on on, uh, the feed, the sound and the quality and so forth. And, but before we do all that, we've got to sit down and do research, 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 research of what the trends are, not necessarily your own personal experience, because that could be good or bad. (laughs) Those that know me know why I'm laughing. And you also want to know what the trends are and what people are doing. So we continue 
looking at that. On some personal um, issues, I think the last couple of shows I've had a little bit of a throat issue. My voice, voice hasn't projected as firmly. And it's a result of I've been in the in my yard. I got a brand new house. It's a, a year and a half old. And it's a, it's a lovely home. Everything is up to par. But the home builder was as cheap as can be. And I think the reason for it is because, you know, I kind of got him good on the deal. I came in on the introduction offer. I upgraded over $30,000 in upgrades. And then they wanted to raise the price of the house, but I had a signed contract, which I kept in my back pocket for like 90 days. So when they tried to pull that on me, they couldn't because we had a signed contract. So, um, you know, I got kicked in the shins a little bit too. And one of them was in my landscaping and um, a French drain operation that should be around the perimeter of the house and isn't there. And and when I first moved here, the first year, it was a drought. And, and I live in Florida in the Tampa Bay area. And uh, there was a drought in the area. I think without any exaggeration, it rained maybe five times within that year I was I was in. But a couple of those times, you know, uh, the clouds opened up and it, it was a monsoon that fell. And I, I quickly uh, developed and found out that my uh, backyard was flooded. So uh, a bunch of back and forth with the home builder on, um, on that issue. I had it when I first came in on one side of the house. They did create a French drain. I guess it cost them about two grand to do it. So they didn't want to do it on the other side in the backyard. So we went back and forth. So anyway, to make a long story short, I ended up being the sucker doing the French drain all by myself. Now, I don't have dirt in my backyard. I have a hard substance called clay, which actually uh, masquerades itself as cement. As you dig, this thing does not move. So to do a, a two foot or a foot and a half trench, you've got to work. You've definitely got to work. But anyway, we'll cover that after we come back from the LP News Countdown. One. I want to warn everybody that the three news segments I'm going to read are ext extremely socialistic in nature. We'll just say that. But our first article up, Rochester. Oh, nope, no, we're not doing Rochester. Sorry, Philadelphia police. Uh, they create a policy after the Starbucks incident. Uh, Philadelphia police alter trespassing policy after Starbucks arrest. Two months after the arrest of two black pra patrons at a Philadelphia Starbucks caused a national outcry, the city police department instituted a new policy for handling trespassing calls. In a major change announced Friday by Philadelphia Police Commissioner Richard Ross, officers are now required to attempt to de-escalate and mitigate the disturbance and to use their discretion with trespassing allegations on private property that open to the public. Before making an arrest, the officers are now expected to determine that the offender understands the, requ the request to leave the establishment and, the w and then witness the person refusing to honor the legitimate request. Officers may also call for special specialists trained in crisis intervention. So this is a lot about a lot of nothing here. It's a nothing burger. But basically what they're saying is that they're forced now to ensure, it's not, uh, usually they do a trespass after warning type of thing. Police officer comes and tells you you have to leave. And while you're sitting there thinking about leaving, the, the police officer basically leaves and he might kind of see you wander off but they leave, 
and then the establishment calls back and you're back again and they just arrest you. Well, now they want you to actually leave the, the given area, uh, institute maybe a crisis intervention if you're mentally ill, and a couple of other things. Listen, this is a public establishment, uh, but it's a private entity. So it becomes a civil matter. The officers are just there to uh, be peacemakers. And they're there to transmit the message to the patron. The owner of the establishment does no longer want you sitting here. And usually it starts an argument with the officers and towards the, um, the, pat uh, the establishment. And there's where the conflict arises. So uh, apparently the officers in Philadelphia were robotic in this. They just, uh, oh, they want you to leave. You're going to leave, yes or no? Oh, you're not going to leave? Get up, turn around, place your hands behind your back. The police officers did their job. Uh, so this is a liberal agency throwing itself at the mercy of Starbucks now by basically saying that we had to tweak what we did because if we had it tweaked, we wouldn't have gotten in this mess. And that's a bunch of baloney because the two that were sitting there were going to get arrested point blank sooner or later because they didn't want to leave as simple as that and Starbucks wanted them gone so here's uh, an example of being caught up in a liberal issue you're it's it's a police matter you go you set the peace accord you basically tell them unfortunately my friend you've got to leave and if they don't then I got to place you under arrest give them a little time frame and then after they uh, don't comply, then they got to go. So anyway, they wrote this big policy, uh, a nothing burger. What can I tell you? But it's in the news. All right, number two. Two. All right, moving right along into our liberal-type media. Baltimore Schools uh, Board, Baltimore School Board to vote on new policy for police officers. The Baltimore School Board is is set to vote this week on swearing, uh, sweeping new policies for school police that backers say are aimed at keeping schools safe without criminalizing students. The vote Tuesday on policies and general orders followed months of debate from feedback from the community. Baltimore is the only district in Maryland with a sworn police force. Advocates for students have long pushed the district to craft a progressive school policy. Their, uh, their calls for action took on a new urgency in 2016 after a viral video showed an officer at Reach Partnership School slapping and kicking a student inside the building. Akel Ham took over as acting police chief and after the incident and was appointed to the position in May 2017. He has overseen a drop in school-based arrest for the past two years. No students have filed a complaint alleging improper police conduct. Clearly, we have changed the way we police, Ham said. He, he said the policy would keep the district on the right track. You know, um, I can't really comment on this because I don't know too much information. Hopefully it does work. But if if complaints are down because they're arrested down because officers are just not enforcing anything anymore because they don't want to be uh, battered, abused by their chief, then this is not a success story. According to the media report, it is because things are down. But so they, they were down on Parkland, too. They were kind of not talking the truth over there. They weren't reporting crime. They weren't writing incidents. And look what happened. 17 are dead. So whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, is still the jury's still out on it. But it's a good thing that everybody is talking. We'll say that. All right, next one. Three. And our last story takes us over to San Diego, where the San Diego police issued new policy on handling people living in the U.S. illegally. San Diego Police Department recently released an update 
policy on how officers should handle police people living in the U.S. illegally that reflects California's new sanctuary state law, SB uh, State Bill 54, that went into effect this year. San Diego policy has a new revision that specifically states officers shall not inquire into individuals' immigration status. Officers are prohibited from transporting detained undocumented persons to the police facility for the sole purpose of releasing them to DHS Border Patrol. And if, after concluding the investigation, officers determine that the person is not involved in a criminal activity, the person shall be Release regardless of the immigration status. It is also includes a long list of instances where people living in the U.S. illegally can be transferred to U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement or ICE, which were not included in the old policy. The policy stipulates that a person living in the U.S. illegally can be handled o- o- handed over to ICE when he or she has been convicted of committing and that's a big word, convicted of committing or attempting to commit a conspiracy to commit a serious violent felony. So that that's an open-ended policy. Now, I'm going to kind of defend the San Diego Police Department here because they're in a bad pickle. You're First of all, you got a lunatic for a governor that thinks that he ha- he has his own empire, and you're literally passing an, a state statute saying that you don't have to enforce federal law, which is the law of the land, where the police officer's ID say that they will defend the Constitution of the United States. So you talk about wackiness, well, this is one of them. And it puts the officers in a bad bind. It puts the agencies in them, too. So they've got to create a warped, crazy policy to defend a crazy, warped law in a state which will most likely be stricken down by the Supreme Court sooner or later. This is basic mathematics here, folks. Two plus two equals four. But if you allow a liberal to answer that, they'll tell you it's two, po- it's two plus two equals 4.6, and then they'll explain where the point six came from. And by the time they finish, they'll insult you six times over, and you, as you're walking away, might start to believe them. Mm-mm-mm. So that's the story. El Police a Radio Countdown. And now as soon as the bugler wakes up, we can roll with the show. <laughs> Episode number 40, The Policy. Now, again, you know, we've we've got less than an hour to cover a, a, a serious serious topic, and I always tell uh, listeners on on the program, we're not going to cover everything because it's just physically impossible. We can't cover all all, all, uh, law enforcement's wrongdoing in in such a short time. But one of the things we're going to talk about is the policy. Now, we discussed in opening remarks that the agency can have feedback from the officers that have to enforce the policy. They can have a committee that creates the policy. They can have experts from the agency develop portions of the policy and combine it into one. Or they can have their own section that develops, does the research, the benchmarking of the policy. When we say benchmarking, they're comparing their agency to another agency of similar size and seeing what they wrote. Some agencies are brilliant in copying other people's policies, and you reach out to your benchmark uh, jurisdictions, and you basically look at what they wrote, oh, this looks good, and you go ahead and uh, retype it, uh, make a little couple changes to fit your agency, send it over to legal, rubber stamped, and all of a sudden there's your policy. The committee aspect of it might take a little longer, a lot of opinionated people, so it'll be a slower process. Now, the policy section or a section in your agency that creates policy and reviews policy and updates current policy, 
they would be tasked with doing this. Now, what the issue is there is that a lot of agencies don't like the fact of using sworn personnel to cover these positions, so they put in civilians. So sometimes the person typing away is a civilian. And what they do is they kind of uh, try to reach out to the local talent within the agency and a little feedback here and there. But there's no buy-in, and the reason there isn't a buy-in is if I'm out on the field and you're bugging me about three paragraphs on a policy, uh, just to get you off my back, I might tell you, yeah, yeah, it sounds good. I need to read the totality of what you're trying to create. I need to know what the objective is. I need to know exactly what path and road the agency wants to take in order for me to have an educated opinion. Too often, these policies are created on half-stepping. Okay, I ask you a general question, you, you kind of give me a general answer, and then I take that and I run with that and I put it in the policy. But everything is general in nature, so when you read the full package, it, it just doesn't sound good. Now, during my career, I had the pleasure of of being influential in several policies as a subject matter expert. And one of the last ones I did, of course, the agency couldn't wait for me to get the hell up out of there because as soon as I left, they took that portion of the policy, ripped it out, buried it 20 feet underneath ground, and acted like it never happened. But it was a restraint device that uh, we were including in the use of force policy. And it was a painstaking process. It, it took about six weeks to complete. And uh, I was tasked with going there at the policy section about twice a week. And every word was, was mammoth. And I felt that the policy section was not handling it properly. I think what the best thing they could have done is given general topic outlines of what they wanted to accomplish and have the subject matter experts answer those questions verbally, and then they can abstract from the verbal um, notation and then go ahead and create the policy. I mean, I'll give you an example. If, 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 if you said uh, uh, the restraints could be used um, to transport it into, oh, what do you mean by could? Can we use another word? And, then and all of a sudden, you're spending an hour playing dictionary. And, and what other word can we use and this and that? And it's a, it's, a, it's a waste of time. I also found out very early on that any policy development has to have training involved from, the, from inception. Those two go hand in hand. And anybody who thinks it doesn't is nuts. Um, but anyway, that's my little take on what's going on. There is a organization out there by the, the name of Power DMZ. And what they do is they do policies and um, training for officers via online. Very good company. We're going to put the link on lpoliceradio.com. They help a, an enormous amount of agencies. So they put out a request for agencies to uh, help them in their service, in their survey on policy review or policy enactment. And they had 343 agencies respond to their survey. Uh, mostly the agencies that were contacting them were small agencies, about 39% of them. Big agencies were about 11. And of all those agencies, 68 of them were accredited. Now, here's a couple of things that I feel that you need to look at when you're really pushing forward with a new policy, not a revised one, but a new one. You got to make sure you don't have a change in leadership because if a new leader comes into an agency, they have their own mindset on things on how they want to see it. And that one little policy that they create can change a whole lot of other policies so number one, does the policy that you're creating interact with other policies? And if they do, do those other policies need to be changed as a result of the creation of the new one? 
That's very important. Benchmarking. It's important, but it's not vitally important. What I mean by that is agency similar in size to yours and budgetary and officer population-wise, you can go ahead and abstract whatever policies they have on the books. But here's what you need to evaluate. Has their policy been litigated? Okay, in the agency I came from, they would tell you to do benchmarks. You do benchmarks all freaking day, calling people, and they'd send you stuff. But it was not weighed on capability. And one of those capabilities was there a challenge to this policy. Because if I'm going to copy it, I need to know that. And a lot of agencies don't do that. They just benchmark them and take them. And what's the difference between my agency and the agency that I'm benchmarking? Well, we might be similar in size and in budget, but not in, in population, let's say. It could be I have a different type of ethnic group in my population versus that other jurisdiction, or I might have a higher rate in crime, let's say in robbery, and they have a higher one on auto theft. And so we're comparing sometimes apples to oranges. We look the same, but we, you know, there is such a thing as an orange and a tangerine. So that's what I'm saying. So you got to be careful on the benchmarking thing. Some agencies benchmark, benchmark, benchmark. That's all they love. They love that benchmark. Um, a lot of agencies in this survey with Power DMS, they basically said that they were, uh, 49% of them said that they uh, created a policy to keep officers safe. Now, that's uh, primarily true, but it's also when they say safe, they mean the work within guidelines. So there's a catch-22 there uh, for the officers, too. So you, let's be mindful of what, what that actually means. 20% of their policies are, are to earmark for protecting its citizens. And um, ensuring if it could be carried out in the field is only 15% important. Well, the insurance of it out in the field should be that specialized committee and it has to be made up of training because training will ultimately have to train on a policy eventually, especially if it's misconstrued by the entire population of the agency and they're not doing things properly. So let's take a look at one item, get off policy a second, and let's turn into training. One of the issues that we look at in training is there's very different types of segment in training. You have national standards, and that's usually in use of force as an example. A case law that's come down from the United States Supreme Court, and that tells you how you're going to govern your use of force. You also have state standards or state statutes that require the agency to comply with those state standards or state uh, statutes, and they're part of your policy as well. Then you have departmental directives. Let's say an agency uh, is not doing very well in um, citizen interaction, a lot of complaints. So the agency chief now says to the training section, in your in-service training of your yearly, I want all officers trained on interaction with citizens. So that's kind of the, the elements that are provided in a training section. And then there's a other segment, your fourth segment, in procedural directives. Now, this is when it gets really comical because a lot of agencies don't explain how to carry out the procedure. What they do is they tell you, well, read the policy, it tells you. But the policy might be vague in nature, so it leaves it up to interpretation. Now, interpretation has to be concluded by supervisors, but not all supervisors have been created equal. Follow me here so far? So now we have a little area of the Bermuda Triangle where people get lost. Now, agency buy-in is a big one. The command staff. I'm a firm believer that in any policy that an agency has, their command staff have to buy into it. They can argue, scream at each other, pull each other's hairs out in their conference rooms, 
But once it's a policy, it's the law of the land in their agency, and they have to abide by it. And once they buy it, abide by it, it trickles down. And then the training section should immediately seize the opportunity in the staff, the command staff buying in, and develop a curriculum in case they have to train on that specific procedure or policy. Very important, but sometimes it's not the norm. Now, let's look at Power DMZ and some of the, the issues that they talked about as far as their survey with uh, 343 agencies. They talked about uh, the buy-in policy, what we talked about. Important, it came out, number one, command staff buy-in was 28%. All levels of the agency buy-in, 26%. And training buying into it, the policy was only at 12%. Benchmarks with other agencies, uh, 79% said that they agreed in getting a benchmark with another agency. 74% said they had agreed with accreditation. Make sure that the policy that they're getting is accredited, and we'll talk about accreditation in a second. Supervisory level, okay, as far as b buying in into this policy was at a 71%. Legal standards, 68%, and training at a 58%. Now, you might wonder, what do all these percentages mean? They don't mean a whole hell of a lot until you equate them to your agency. They used to pose a question to us, several questions to us when I was active in training, and they would say, what do you think about this, and what do you think about that? But you weren't giving me the entire equation. So for me to give you the answer to a mathematical equation, you have to give me the entire equation. You can't say three times, what's the answer? You haven't told me what the equation is. Okay, follow me here? Okay, policy changes. When they do a policy change, should, uh, they send it out electronically. How many agree with that? 63% of the agencies agree with that. 53 said roll call. 35 said email. And 16% said the training unit. Now, electronically, what they mean by that is that there's a data. They usually use software to do that, to track that it went out. They can show in litigation, look, it went out. There was a policy review, and there's an acknowledgement from the staff member. So that, that's why the percentage is so high. Electronic signature or signing off on the policy, using software, 64%, and roll call, 53%. And training in service 45 via a quiz or something 29 hard copy who the hell does hard copy nowadays I remember when I started oh my god if you had a policy that's 60 pages long 2,000 people I mean do the math on that one well, anyway 26 percent do hard copy and email read receipt 11 percent now here's the issue with roll call and emailing and all this other baloney you want me to sign off on a policy depending on what size it is. It might be a short policy, two or three pages. It might be a gazillion pages. And you want me to sign off on something at roll call, which is 15 minutes? Hello? This thing working? It doesn't work. So there has to be, in my view, a section that goes out through email, read receipt, and I give you the length of time to read the policy. And let's say I say next month, that's 30 days, we're going to cover this review. Now, agencies should be in the mindset of getting accredited hours or time spent. Let's say in a pay period, an officer, and I'm just throwing numbers up, and some of the people, out, the unions or people are cheering. And, but some of the other people listening might say, this guy's nuts. But I'm not as nutty as you think I am. Let's say, and I'm, it's a hypothetical, they get two hours of pay period, okay, that is given to them as administrative time. Well, it's for them to read some of this stuff on their personal time because you just can't uh, drive a police car, respond to calls, uh, work a tear at a jail, and, oh, I, I forgot, I've got to review the 83-page policy. It's not, it's not the norm. So there has to be 
time given in order to get this practice done. So let's say we do the email read receipt. They, re they take it electronically, giving them the opportunity. They can download it on tablets and stuff like that. So we don't have to kill trees. And then we, uh, we do the, the 30 days later, the roll call acknowledgement, let's say. Or we use the software, whatever. But now you, the officers have been afforded the opportunity. Now, how many people know those people that will bitch about anything? If you say, congratulations, you're a lottery winner. You just won $20 million. They'll bitch. Why do I got to wait till next month to get the money? Or why do I got to pay taxes? They'll bitch about something. So... Those people exist, but now you've afforded them the opportunity to be a voice. So when they're not a voice, then that says a lot about uh, their professional conduct. So if a system is created uh, that the officer can read this policy, now they need a voice. What, what do I do if I find something that's confusing or wrong or I think it'd be done better? What are we going to use? A suggestion box in the in the officer's mess? No, I need a vehicle, and that should be done via a committee. And each section, precinct, station house, or facility should have a representative on that committee that the officer through or via their supervisor can send their proposal or questions to their committee representative, which is their representative on the committee. Follow me so far? Now, the committee will have X amount of time to tweak maybe 30, 90 days to tweak the final draft of the policy and make sure that everybody is buying into it. Back to the command staff, do an actual meeting with the command staff on, on all these sections that I just talked about and make sure we get buy-in. If you don't get buy-in, you got to go through the process until you do. All things can be mitigated. And at the end, the chief of the agency is the one that's going to make the decision on whether or not they're going to accept uh, some of the recommendations. Now, why am I making it that complicated? Well, because it's important for everybody to have a voice, especially when you're enacting a new policy. Now, let's take a, a look at another a survey that uh, Power DMS asked. Effectiveness of policy, how important? How do they measure it? They measure it through accreditation, which is number one, 58%. Monitoring officers, if the officers are complying with the policy, that's at 41%. Well, guess what? That's after the fact. So, oh, oh, uh, you failed. I'm going to write you up. You didn't follow the policy. Uh, 41%. So how many people I got to write up to figure out that something's wrong? So I, I don't like that one. Uh, compare uh, model policies or other people's policies at 41%. Complaints. Citizen complaints that come in via a specific policy is way 39%. Audits. They, they do audits through accreditation uh, process in the agency, 38% or a survey to all staff, 31%. Uh, so, again, what do these numbers mean? They don't mean a hell of, of beans if you don't weigh it against your agency. Now, here's a couple of don'ts that I don't like. Don't like civilians in positions of authority over a sworn policy. Make sense? Okay. Let's think about this. Your special forces, let's say your Army Ranger, Delta Force, Navy SEAL, Marine Raider, doesn't matter. There you are, your special forces. You're trained up, you're geared up for this. And then there's a secretary typing around how you're to perform your duties. Now, it happened in the recent um, Gulf conflicts where the past administration created the rules of engagement, and they were very troublesome compared to the rules of engagement we have today under Secretary of Defense Mattis, 
we've annihilated the the enemy. They're gone. They're 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 almost kaput. Why? They changed the name of the game because the people involved were the people that knew what they were doing. So it's a big difference. The analogy I'm trying to give, you have a civilian in command or in charge of a, a given policy or policy section, and they are writing away and their staff is writing away for an initiative that will be carried out by sworn staff. It is mind-boggling, but it happens. So if your agency has that, that's a trigger point that there's a, a, a problem. And again, I said that a lot of agencies have a problem that they don't like law enforcement officials in the position that they're sworn sitting behind a desk playing with paper. But sometimes I believe that the general patent rule can accomplish. If you work five days a week, 40 hours, a general patent had a saying, see and be seen. Well, I can sit behind the desk, but I need to get my ass up out of the desk and go see the troops and see the functionality of what I'm reviewing and looking at, whether it works or doesn't work. So I think it can be done and, and quickly managed, and some of these agencies are not doing that all too often. So we could talk about policies all day long, but if the agency doesn't think of ground rule number one, which is the officer that has to implement the policy, is it doable? We failed. Now, some policies go out and need to be retweaked. I understand that. But there's some agencies that have just failed. They, they copy, benchmark, they run with it, and next thing you know, they're in court. So policies. It is a very difficult process because you're not only evaluating the present, you're going to review the past and you're going to implement for the future. And those three elements could be very, very confusing. Now it's time for the all nine training tip. Since we're on policy, it's very important, and I've talked about this in the past, you as the employee of a law enforcement agency, let's say you're actually in the position that the department is implementing a policy or upgrading a policy. And I know how the routine goes. Just show me what the update is. Okay, okay. And you just go ahead and sign off on it. Or a new policy that's being created. Uh, it's too many pages. I don't have time for this crap. And then you just basically sign off on it. But you have a fiduciary duty to ensure that you fully understand that policy as it's being created and the functionality of that policy. And there's where it becomes tricky, the functionality. So as a cardinal rule, I, I say, is in examining a policy, look at and dissect the policy in various areas. Number one, functionality. How does the officer carry out the duties that the policy is calling for? And, and number two, the practicability. How practical is it that the officer can do what the policy is making him or her do? And in other words, if it says the officer shall this and the officer will that, is that reasonable? Can they do that? Is there a relief factor to that? Is there a time constraint to that? So evaluating and dissecting that policy and writing out certain questions, either in your head or in written format, will help you digest the policy a little bit better. Of course, the following analysis is the implementation. When you yourself are found in the middle of that policy and you have to carry it out, as soon as you detect something that just is not right, it's time to have that friendly conversation 
or correspondence with your supervisor immediately and pointing out what you had difficulty in understanding, carrying out, absorbing, whatever the circumstances are. This will most likely help you tremendously in your career. A little bit on the time consuming, but remember, it's not your game, it's theirs. You're just playing in it. And now it's time for the conversation. How many of us think that we can fulfill the law that God has created? The Ten Commandments. He, they wrote it out. And each individual was opposed to or supposed to carry out those rules, those laws. The law of man, the law that was written in Scripture. Can man carry those things out? Well, we know the answer. And how do I know the answer? Well, it's in the Bible. Man couldn't carry him out. And man, because of the hardness of his heart, because of the corrupt nature and sinful birth that he's had, is difficult to carry out the law, the law as written by God. So he sent an advocate, God did, in the form of Jesus Jesus died on the cross. As a result that he died on the cross, the law, the rule, the policy, now, it's still there, but now you're covered through his mercy and his grace that allow you to walk within those rules, to walk within that policy. Even though you make mistakes, he can pick you up and make you go right through to everlasting salvation. You see, the, the death of the cross buried the law on how man had to carry it out. Now, it went from law to obedience, but God is faithful. And if you fail in those rules, Jesus is faithful enough to show the Father, which is God, the holes in his hands from his crucifixion, burying the law and allowing you to walk in grace and in mercy. What you have to do in order to do that, a couple things. One, repent of your sins and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Of course, if you do that, then you should be walking in obedience. And those combinations of those three, okay, will allow you salvation and him that is faithful. What's up next, folks? Well, the long-anticipated Money is the Root of All Evil nautical. And it's a show it's gonna, we're going to touch upon uh, the narcotics trade and all the amounts of gross amounts of money, billions and billions of dollars that are generated. What was the reward of all these drug dealers? Well, it wasn't a good one. Why? They weren't walking in obedience, and they definitely w were not walking within the law. As a result, death or imprisonment. So that's not a good thing. But that's up next, and that will be on Narco, and uh, entitled Money is the Root of All Evil. And we know that that's true because our Lord and Savior has told us so. You know, you can always hook up with us on lpoliceradio.com. Scroll down to the bottom. There's the social icons and pop them back up. I personally am on Twitter. I release a lot of uh, tweets, I guess you want to call them, on Alpha Mike 2017. One word uh, altogether, that's the hash mark or, or the call sign or whatever you want to call it. And I throw a lot of ideas out there, a lot of news articles, and a lot of those will be part of research that I capture or part of future episodes that are coming. We have a long list of shows on lpoliceradio.com. Long list. We're up to number 40. We're moving on down. 
before you know it, it'll be 400, 400, 500. Gee, when is this guy going to shut up? Well, I'll shut up when the topics go away. But in the meantime, I'll still continue to speak. For those that take the opportunity of their valuable time to listen to this guy with a horsey voice carry on and on and on about things, I hope that what I say blesses you and you learn something from this babbling that I'm doing. Mentorship has been always important to me in providing it. I did it when I was an officer, and as a retired one, I continue doing it either face-to-face -face with certain individuals or over the phone. But most importantly, I can do it now via this microphone and mentor many people based on knowledge. One thing that you can't give anybody in an academy class or through a policy or a brochure, experience. Well, we've reached the end of our journey on today's episode, and I know you've learned something. Be a supporter of law enforcement, especially your local law enforcement, and know that you make a difference. God bless you. God bless the United States of America, and God bless the Republic. Alpha Mike signing out.